If you have your Bibles, would you turn to a very familiar passage? Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. A passage that I know I've preached on many times. And the Lord directed me to preach from this passage a week ago. I argued with God because as I've preached on this often. There's people in our church that take notes and they put on their Bibles dates. Every time I preach from a passage, they're going to let me know that. But the Lord reminded me that his word never expires. And... So I'm going to preach from this passage, and quite frankly, I'm thinking, okay, this should be an easy sermon because I've preached on this before, but for whatever reason, this has been probably one of the most difficult weeks I've had preparing for a very familiar passage. So right now, I'm preaching with an attitude. I'm angry at the devil. I'm angry at the devil, so I'm preaching with an attitude. Because I know that God spoke to me a week ago. And he knows that this is for someone here today. Amen. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. But those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Have you been going from one fainting spell to another? Maybe right now you, you're holding on, you're saying, I, I, just standing here, I feel like fainting. I'm tired. Pastor, I have never been this fatigued in my life, not just physically, but spiritually. I'm having crazy thoughts about God because I'm tired. When you're tired, you think crazy thoughts. I know that this past year, I've, I've been in contact with many pastors. I'm on a few forums closed forums on social media with senior pastors. And I have never seen so many pastors say they have never been this discouraged and this tired, this fatigued as ever. Many of them are quitting the ministry. I have never seen so many church people say they're tired, they're fatigued. A combination of, of, a combination of uh, pandemic, COVID, politics and the White House and racial unrest and news and finances and barges on the Pacific Ocean with our Christmas gifts still on it, all those things just wearing people out and God's people just not feeling, I just don't feel like worshiping, I don't feel like going to church, I just don't feel uh, like doing anything. And I'm here to remind you from God's word. And I'm not reminding you. God's word is reminding you that you, that God can give you the victory over fainting spells. I say God can give you the victory over fainting spells. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I just pray that you may just take my feeble words, my my thoughts, uh, this preparation. And Lord, that you may grant, place your hand upon me, upon the words. Let this not be just an exhortation, uh, uh, a little sermonette. But, Father, I pray that your anointing will be upon me, upon this message, and that our hearts will be receptive to what you want us to hear today, O oh God. Lord, we are a needy people, and we need you, O oh God. We need a Savior. And I pray right now that you, you will speak to us as you have been already during this service. Speak to us. I pray that someone here will be delivered from fainting spells. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated if you're able to. Something that I like to do when I preach, and I'm preaching from a passage from a part of the Bible that people are not familiar with, and this is so important. I, I like to, I like to uh, take a moment 
which I'm doing right now, to give you context. You can't just pick a Bible verse from the Bible and not see the neighborhood it's from. Not see why it's there, what's the historical background, what's the meaning behind it, because it adds so much flavor to what's happening. So I like to take time to explain the context. This is a verse that many of you know. You may have a poster in your house with this verse on it. But I'm not sure many, many know the context of that verse. This verse is found in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah was written about 700 years before Christ. And the word, the name Isaiah means Yahweh is salvation. Isaiah was a prophet and he prophesied during the most crucial period in the history of Judah and, Jer- and, and Israel. And despite the outward conformity to godliness, Israel had gradually backslid and Israel had fallen into serious moral and spiritual decline. Uh, Despite uh, one more revival in Judah under King Josiah, uh, Judah still slipped eventually into, I call it, the sin of sloppy holiness. The sin of sloppy holiness and would eventually also be uh, uh, go into captivity uh, because of their sin and their sloppiness, just like Israel. In, in, in the book of, of, of uh, uh, Isaiah, there's 66 chapters, very similar. Someone I read someplace that the book of Isaiah is very similar uh, uh, as, as a type of the Bible, but the Bible has 66 books. Uh, the book of Isaiah has 66 chapters. The, the Bible is divided by the Old Testament and the New Testament with Jesus Christ being the centerpiece of the middle. Uh, the Old Testament talking about the future Messiah. Uh, the New Testament talking about the Jesus that came to the world. And so is uh, also Isaiah. Isaiah has 66 chapters. It is roughly divided into two sections with chapter 40 being the in-between. And that's where this verse that I just read to you is located, chapter 40. Chapter 40 is the transitional chapter between part one of Isaiah and part two of Isaiah. Part one deals with the burdens of judgment against the the disobedience of Judah and Israel and the pagan nations. Part two, uh, it's Isaiah prophesying about Israel's return from captivity and the coming of the Messiah, an exhortation to the Jews that eventually were in captivity, the remnant, uh, the exhortation to them that soon the Messiah is coming. They that wait upon the Messiah, they that wait upon the Lord, hallelujah. No Old Testament book with the possibility, with the possible exception of Psalms, speaks more powerfully to the church today. We are the remnant today, prophetically pointing to Jesus Christ. So when we read Isaiah and when we read this passage, it's not just talking about the remnant waiting for the Messiah, but it's talking about the church of Jesus Christ today. They may be tired and fatigued and feel bruised and battered. And God speaking to the church today saying, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Interesting, the book of uh, Isaiah predicted uh, specific events in the life of Jesus Christ that they predicted these things 700 years earlier. In fact, the book of Isaiah is quoted in the New Testament 21 times, including by Jesus himself quoted from Isaiah. So you see, uh, this passage here that I'm reading from is talking about Uh, uh, the remnant that was in captivity and God was basically reminding the remnant, don't make decisions based upon your surroundings and how you're feeling, but make decisions based upon what I have promised you. You see, folks, today the enemy has tried to wear out and discourage the church of Jesus Christ. He has tried so hard to discourage. And when I say the church, I'm not talking about the institution. I'm talking about the people of God. You are the church of Jesus Christ. You are the church. The church, the word church in the New Testament comes from the word ecclesia. 
E-K-L-E-S-I-A. Those of you that speak Spanish, you may recognize the word iglesia. It comes from the Greek word ecclesia, which ecclesia means those called out to assemble together to one common cause. Come out from there and come here and come together, sit in the same place, come to the same place to proclaim, to proclaim uh, uh, what God is doing. Uh, you see, and this is interesting, in, in historical times when the Roman government would, would send, uh, would conquer a city, the Roman government would send someone to the city uh, that was called an apostle, same word, and the apostle would go into the city and to begin to clean house and prepare the city to be taken over by a new kingdom. And, and once that happened, once that got that established, once the, once the apostle got bulldozed his way in, then everyone knew that this, we would be different. And then a, someone that would come, uh, a preacher, the Greek word for preaching, that we used to, a preacher would come or a, a herald would come and would come to the town center and proclaim and call it an ecclesia meeting. A call that meeting, and this uh, this uh, preacher would proclaim, "Everybody here, everybody in town, this is a new day. This is a new beginning. Town Square, leave your houses, come and gather together. Come to this assembly. We're gonna have a meeting." And that process was called the ecclesia, the gathering of God's people. And when God's people come together, the enemy tries to bring discouragement because he does not want his kingdom eliminated and replaced by the kingdom of God. I'm trying to show you folks the big picture. It's not about your own little world. It's about what God is doing in this world, in your life, and in this ministry, in this church, in this country, hallelujah. Today, the enemy has tried to wear out and discourage the church by draping the church with a wet blanket of discouragement and fatigue. And you may be here today, and you are the church. I'm here to tell you that God is speaking to you today, family, life, assembly of God, watching online or here today. God is speaking to you today. And the word of the Lord for the church today it's found in Isaiah. Turn on your Bibles back to Isaiah chapter 40. And I'm going to start reading verse 27, which preludes the verse that I read. This is God speaking to us today. Amen. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my just claim is passed over by my God? In other words, God is saying, why are you saying God has ghosted me? God doesn't see me and God doesn't see my troubles. Oh, God has chosen to ignore me. God is saying to us today, that's crazy thoughts. You're thinking crazy thoughts and saying crazy things because you have crazy thoughts. Verse 28, God's still speaking. Have you not known? Don't you know? Have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the earth, of the ends of the earth, neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. God doesn't faint. God doesn't get tired. God doesn't get discouraged. What is God trying to tell us this morning? God is trying to tell you and me, don't project your fainting feelings on the Lord. Just because you feel tired, just because you feel discouraged, just because you feel fatigued, don't project that on God. Well, then therefore God must be tired. God must be fatigued. God must be listless. God must be discouraged. God is saying, don't do that. Don't do, you do it everybody else, but don't play that game with me. Don't project your feelings on me. You see, folks, God is reminding us this morning that he never faints. He never becomes fatigued. God never burns out. Hallelujah. 
He doesn't burn out. Oh, it's been 22 months since the pandemic happened. God is not counting. It doesn't affect God. God is still the same today, yesterday, today, and forever. Hallelujah. God is not worn out like you are. Verse 29, he gives power, power to the weak. And to those that have no might, he increases strength. God is saying, I'm not ignoring you. In fact, I want to empower you. I want to give you power. The word power here in the Hebrew means endurance, stamina, strength. A force, a vigor, power. Those of you that maybe have run a marathon, I never run a marathon, but I hear that people that run marathons, don't run. 27 mile marathon, New York City. And then some of them don't make it, some of them, uh, many of them, they drop like flies, they get fatigue. By the time they get to Staten Island, they're, they're dropping like flies. By the time they get to Brooklyn, by the time they get to the Bronx, and back there, they're dropping like flies. But there's some. They experience a second surge of power. They call it the second wind. And the second wind gives them the power and the energy as if they were running the race from the beginning again. God wants to give you a second wind power, hallelujah, of endurance. Verse 30, even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall. In other words, it's normal for people to get tired. It's normal for people to get weary and faint. We're only humans, even full of life young people, they get tired. It's okay to admit, I'm, I'm tired, I am fatigued. It's okay. Stop Playing the game, start, stop hiding, stop telling people that you're, that you're doing fine when you're not. Be honest with yourself and with God. Say, God, I'm tired, I'm fatigued. I feel like dropping. I feel like quitting. I love you, but man, I just, I'm, I'm just, I, I'm ready for heaven. Now. And then the verse, the, the main text today. Then the Lord says, but those... Those, there's people that just, they're, they're like salmon. They, 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 they swim upstream when everybody else is going downstream. But those that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. Now you have to understand here, I got to do a little teaching here. The word wait, it's also the same word as hope. In the Hebrew, it's the same word. Wait a hope. So you can take that verse, and, and in, in other translations, it says, those that hope in the Lord. Those that wait, those that hope in the Lord. Hope. What is hope? Hope is the ability, it's the decision to look forward with expectancy and confidence. Hope. Hallelujah. When you have hope, uh, although you cannot see it with your eyes, physical eyes, you, eager, you eagerly anticipate something with your heart. You hope. Hallelujah. Once you lose hope, you're dead. You're dead meat. We need hope. Those that choose to hope in the Lord, that verse 31 can be translated. Those that choose to look upward and forward to the Lord. Hope is looking with your heart upward and forward. Those that hope in the Lord, they're going to bounce back even stronger, even, even greater with more power. Hope, hallelujah. Hope. There's all kinds of hope. Some of you are hoping there'll be, uh, the economy will change. Some of you are hoping that maybe there'll be a change in political leadership. Some of you may be hoping uh, that you get a raise. Some of you may be hoping uh, uh, different things, and that's okay. But there's one hope that is supreme above all other hopes. In Titus chapter 2, verse 13, I don't have it in the PowerPoint, but listen carefully. It says, looking for the blessed hope. Looking for the blessed hope 
and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. The blessed hope. What is that talking about? There's a hope that the Lord is coming. The Lord is coming. The Messiah is coming. The Savior is coming. And one day, it's not a matter of if. It's, a matter, it's not a matter of when, but it's a matter of if. He, it's imminent. He is coming. It's called the blessed hope. The Bible teaches this, that one day the Lord is going to show up. There's going to be a sound of a trumpet. And the Bible says when he shows up, the dead in Christ, those that you love that have gone to heaven already, the dead in Christ shall rise. Uh, hallelujah, that shall rise. And in a moment that shall rise and have a glorious body and be lifted in the air. And then those of us who are still alive on the earth, we're going we, we're gonna to be caught up in the air with them. It's called the meeting in the air. Hallelujah. Transform. When the blessed hope, not just in an event, but a person shows up, hallelujah. The blessed hope. A lot of churches don't preach about it anymore because people don't want to hear about the future. They want now, instant now, microwave religion, microwave blessings. And we don't want to worry about the Lord coming soon. Looking for the blessed hope, Titus chapter 2, verse 13. And glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Folks, I'm here to tell you, that is the only hope that the Bible describes as blessed. There's different hopes, but this is the only hope that has the word blessed in front of it. Therefore, this hope that is blessed, the blessed hope, therefore, it is supreme. If there's a, any hope that we should hold on to, it's the blessed hope. Hallelujah. Why? Because when he comes, and he will come, the Bible tells us in Romans 8, 18, that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed by him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All this stuff. It's going to look minute compared to the blessed hope when he comes. And you may say, but he's not coming. He comes and, he'll, and he is coming. You have to understand that in the Bible, there's words. There, 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 when it comes to the kingdom of God, when it comes to what God is doing, it, it, it's a, almost like a paradox. Already, but not yet. He has saved me. He will save me. He has come. He will come. The kingdom of God is established and will be established. And we, we've been saved. Those of you that have given your life to the Lord, you have been saved. But we continue to be saved. Uh, we continue working our salvation. He was saved today and he saves us continually. Every day, giving us peace and, and mercy and salvation and rescue and deliverance. He has come. He will continue to come until, until the ultimate time that he comes in a cloud of glory. Someone praise the Lord. Hallelujah. The blessed hope. The blessed hope. See, when, when you hold on to the blessed hope, it will joyfully motivate you. It will joyfully motivate you to look upward and forward. When you forget and disregard the blessed hope, then you get stuck in your funk. You get stuck, you get stuck in your junk. But when you start looking at the blessed hope, you start looking joyfully upward and forward. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Here's the point I want to make. He said, this is, if, you, if you could grasp this, it will bless you. Waiting on the Lord, that phrase that we use all the time, they to wait upon the Lord. Let's sing it. Let's wait upon the Lord. It becomes so cliche, we don't even know what it means. They that wait on the Lord, they that hope on the Lord. That means, listen carefully, it means to go about living for God. Amen. They that wait upon the Lord, they that continue to go about living for God. With fervent, patient hope that he will consummate or complete his will in his time. 
they that wait upon the Lord, they that hope upon the Lord, are those that continue living their life, going about living for God, regardless of the drama, trauma, drama around you. You continue, regardless of the feelings and the fatigue, and I just don't want to get through it, and I just feel, I just, you know, mis- mysterious ailments. Those that wait upon the Lord, they continue to put one foot before the other. Hallelujah, because they have their eyes on the blessed hope. Hallelujah. They have their eyes upward and forward. They are able, when you focus on the blessed hope, you you are able to go about living for God. When you stop remembering about the blessed hope, then you start taking breaks. Then you stop stop living for God. Oh, I can handle it. I need a break. I'll come to church this week. I'm going to come the next. Because you're not focused on the blessed hope. But when you're focused on the blessed hope, you go about living for God. And you may, and when you're living for God, when you're walking, waiting on the Lord, slash waiting, hoping on the Lord, and you go about living for God, you could be, you could be thrown, you could be threatened by a lion's den. Oh, I preached about this two weeks ago. The enemy can come and tell you, if you don't, if you stop, if you don't stop being that religious, if you don't stop living for God, you're going to end up in a lion's den. Oh, I better stop. I better take a hiatus. No. What did Daniel do? The Bible says he went home. He went to the upper room. He opened the windows. And he began to worship God as was his custom. As was his custom. He continued living for God despite the threats around him. Hallelujah. When you're living for God... You could be thrown in a dungeon in shackles. But despite the shackles and the dungeon, you continue going about living for God like Paul and Silas did in that dungeon. They were worshiping God and singing hymns and praising God at midnight. Well, I'm not in the mood. It's midnight. At midnight, they went about living for God. They the wait, the hope, they continue going about living for God. They the wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. And then this verse tells us three specific outcomes. Those of you that like notes and you like one, two, three, here they are. Three specific outcomes. First one, they shall mount up with wings like eagles. Mount up. I'm not going to take time to talk about eagles. The point here is this. They that wait upon the Lord shall mount up. It means you will acquire heaven's perspective. Hallelujah. See, right now when you're tired, you think, you think you, you, you're acting like a worm. You, you're seeing stuff from the ground up. The same stuff is still there. But when you wait on the Lord and you put your hope on the Lord, it may not change the stuff around you. It just makes you transform you from a worm to an eagle. And suddenly you are not downstairs looking up. You're upstairs looking down. You're seeing the same thing from heaven's perspective. You're seeing things from eternity, perspective of eternity. Suddenly those big things, grasshoppers... They're the size of grasshoppers that were intimidating you. When you're in heaven, you see them like little insects. They're still there. But suddenly these things that were intimidating you, they were frightening you, they were wearing you out. Suddenly you see them from a different perspective. You shall mount up with wings as eagles and see it from God's perspective. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So a lot of the times we get ourselves in trouble because we're seeing it like worms. And God wants you to be like an eagle, an eagle that soars above the clouds, as an eagle that, that floats on the, on the storms. An eagle doesn't let the storms get on top of him. An eagle makes sure he's on top of the storms. Hallelujah. 
How many of you remember that old hymn, the chorus, Lift Me Up Above the Shadows? How many of you remember that? Some of you don't. This is so old that it's new. <laughs> and the chorus says, Lift me up above the shadows. Lift me up and let me stand on the mountain tops of glory. Let me dwell in Beulah land. Some of you need to, need to pray, Lord, lift me up above the shadows. I'm tired of being a worm. Let me soar like an eagle. Let me see things from your perspective. Hallelujah. Someone praise the Lord. Hallelujah. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. Number two, they shall run and not be weary. You know what that means? God's going to help you make up for lost time. God will make you, help you make. I used to travel, like many of you, I used to travel for 11 years ago. And I, would, I, was, I had the habit of arriving to the airport late. It was, I, I know. But I knew that if I, I used to fly out of DFW in Dallas a lot. I used to live in Tyler. I used to, and I knew where to park, what door to come in, and I knew that if I had my carry-on, I didn't have to check them in. I knew how to cheat the system. And I knew that if I carried this and carried that, and if I run through this terminal, not that, this terminal, that I could make up for lost time. And when I got there, I always played dumb. Oh, did you check in? Oh, I didn't check in. Do you mind? And they were checking in right there. I avoided a whole step. <laughs> I'm not saying to cheat the system. What I'm telling you is that God will help you run and expedite the time. You thought you were late. You thought you were, oh, I'm too old to be used by God. I've wasted years. God will help you run, hallelujah, expedite uh, what he's doing in your life and redeem the time. He will help you move quickly and efficiently. He will help you run and make up for lost time. Amen. Oh, I've shared this many times with you. I was 30 years old when I quit the ministry. I've been in full-time ministry since I was 18. And in the church plant in New York City, involved in everything. In the ministry, church plant, a single dope ministry with 2,000 singles in, in, in New York City. I was busy. I was busy all over. And I got so caught up in the ministry, I forgot the Lord of the work. You know, you could, listen, folks. Don't be, those of you that you're always signing up for stuff here, I love it. We, we are a church, but don't, we, we have a situation in this church, and we're, I'm addressing it. We have people that sign up to work in ministry here. You're not going to amen me here, but I'm going to meddle. Amen. You're not going to see me Wednesday. We have a whole week, so you have a week to, to forgive me. But we have people in this church, they'll sign up for children's church. They'll sign up for this and for that. And they come. They come to serve on those days. But then when they're not serving, they stay home. Oh, pastor, you got, that's not how you build the church. I, I'm not building the church. That's his baby. I, you know, he builds the church. Hallelujah. And you know what? I'm, I'm afraid. They, they're, busy, busy, busy. they're never in church sitting down. They're always busy doing something. Uh, um, does God doesn't, does, listen, folks, I'm speaking from, speaking from the top down. God doesn't need you that much. Oh, in the God... I, I, Lord, I'm so tired. I need to take a break. Well, have someone else speak. Oh, I, I don't know. He needs, well, you, you, I'm the only one that can speak. And God has reminded me, you ain't the only one. Yeah. If I have to, I'll use a donkey. Amen. You know, a little pride. Little. But we have people that like to be busy, busy, busy. A lot of it's because they're insecure and they need the affirmation of being busy so everyone can see they're busy. I, I, you're not a man to me. I, I hear you. You boycott. I get it. I get it. So that was me. I'm, I'm talking because that was me. I was busy, busy, busy being the superstar in New York City and all kinds of stuff. And I burned out. Yeah, I burned out because the Lord reminded me that ministry became my mistress. Amen. Ministry became my mistress. Ministry affirmed me, applauded me. Oh, we're so happy that you're helping us. Oh, my goodness. How can the church survive without you? And ministry, and it affirmed me. I knew that if I preached, I wore a suit, and, and, I was in a, and I was on top of my game, people would think I'm the superstar. And, you know, I didn't realize that there was pride. Amen. 
And God saying, you know, you have replaced the master with ministry. So I'm a jealous God. So a jealous God. So God removed the ministry so that I had no choice but to worship the master. Yeah. I was 30 years old, quit the ministry, burned out. All my friends left me, and I was so angry at God. I said, God, 30, I'm 30 years old. I've been in full-time ministry since I was 18. The prime of my life, the prime. I spent 12 years helping build this church, helping build a, 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 a large single adult ministry, traveling here, traveling there, building my ministry resume. I've done all this. You know, uh, I, I could have gotten married when I was 21. I could have gotten married when I was 25. And, all, and my relationships down the tubes. Here I am thoroughly, no prospect, no minister, quit the ministry, blacklisted. And the Lord said, now are you willing to wait? Are you willing to hope in me? Are you willing to trust me? Not put your energy in busyness of the ministry. Oh, the church is going to fold. I was the co-founder. It's going to fold. You know, it didn't. And in a way, I was like uh, angry at God. You know, at least they could lose membership. You know, I'm not there anymore. Oh, Pastor Cortez is not here anymore. Let me go to another church. That would have made me feel good. <laughs> they continued. <laughs> you, you're getting quiet at me. I know. You're getting worried. But the point is God had to deal with that. And when I surrendered, the Lord said, just spend time in my presence. Just spend time waiting on me, hoping on me, on me. Not an, an open door, not a gig, not an opportunity, not another sign, not another title. Waiting on me. And that's what I did. I got a secular job. And I just waited. For the first time in years, I had time to read my Bible for me. Not to come up with a sermon, for me. I had time to pray. I would go to church Sunday morning in Long Island, Evangel Church in Long Island City, Queens. I was, I was living in Westchester County, those of you that know New York City, over a bridge, pay tolls, go to Long Island City, go to church in Queens, come back home, go to the evening church. They had Sunday night service. On Tuesday night, I would drive all the way from Westchester County all the way to Brooklyn to attend the Brooklyn Tabernacle prayer meeting. You know why? Because I just wanted to be in the prayer meeting. I wanted to be in the assembly. I, I wanted to be with other people. Not... Not on the platform so they could applaud me and amen me. Just to sit. Just to sit. I needed, I needed, I needed the, to experience the, the blessing of sitting in church with other people. There was something dynamic that happened. Sometimes, you know, some of the messages I don't, I don't even remember. But I remember sitting in church. I remember just being blessed. And that was Tuesday. And Wednesday night I would be in church again at Long Island, Long Island City. Why, why did I do that? To earn brownie points? We got No, God doesn't need my brownie points. I needed it for me. To wait on the Lord, hope in the Lord. And I trusted God. I didn't work in Angola, whatever. I was ready to relocate to Miami. I love Miami. I was going to relocate to Miami, be a social worker, and, and, and attend a church. And I, I surrendered God. So, Lord, at 30 years, I'm 30 years old, 12 years full-time ministry, flush. You know, I'm not going to start. I'm not going to start again. And the, but I said, I'm going to wait on you. Amen. And when I surrendered, trying hard, and I just decided to wait on the Lord, waiting on the Lord, they shall run and not be weary. You know what happened? Within a matter of weeks, weeks happened. Boom, 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 boom. Within a matter of weeks, God opened the doors. I left the job. I was relocated to Tyler, Texas. Tyler, Texas, to work as the crusade director for international advances, R.W. Schambach. If I went from, one, from one, one, one time of not doing anything, just sitting on the side thinking, I'm a, and no one wants me. No one even wants me to be like a junior youth pastor. <laughs> He's 30 years old, and he quit. Huh, huh, I don't want to handle that. Suddenly God, and suddenly I found myself living in Tyler, helping this great evangelist for six years. And you know what happened? God expedited, expedited the time. Everything, all that time that I thought I wasted, one, two, three, four, five, six. He did a work. A quick work, and he gets all the glory. It's too late for me to pastor. It's too late for me to marry a beautiful wife. And I came to the point, Lord, it has to be beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Became a pastor later on in life. 
married later on in life. My son is here today. Most people my age have grandkids in high school. <laughs> my wife and I, you know, we, it was late, but it was not, it was on time. It was on, hallelujah. I'm telling you, when you wait on the Lord, you shall run and not be weary. You shall make up for lost time. And God will ex expedite things. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Number three, I'm closing. Stand. They'll help, they'll help me close quicker. Okay. <laughs> hit him. Someone hit that person. <laughs> Musicians, would you come? They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run. They shall walk in. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. And the last one, number three, they shall walk and not faint. Amen. Walking. Walking speaks of steady progress. It speaks of habits, holy habits. Daniel went to the upper room as was his custom. Amen. The Bible says Jesus went to Gethsemane, the garden to pray, quote, as was his custom. See, when you're walking with the Lord, you're no longer in the, I call it hair on fire mode. We got to do this, we got to do this. Oh, hair on fire mode. God will deliver you from the hair on fire mode and he will help you walk steady progress. No hurry. Don't sweat the small stuff. You know, you're no longer reactionary, but you're purposeful in your walk. You're learning how to serve the Lord one step at a time. You're not trying to impress anybody else, just one step at a time. You're walking worthy. You shall walk, live your life, and not faint. Monday morning, you're not going to faint. Tuesday morning, you're not going to faint. Thanksgiving, as you have Thanksgiving with family members you don't like, you're not going to faint. Don't hit them with the, with the chicken leg or turkey leg. I don't want to have to altar call for repentance. You have good days, you have bad days, but you still walk steady. Some pe sometimes people love you, sometimes they hate you. You walk steady. You plod on. Let me share a story, then I'll close in prayer. Four years ago, in my pastoral ministry, suddenly I had an unexpected curveball here as a pastor of this church, both my wife and I. We experienced a very unexpected, very unexpected situation. Very complicated. And it wasn't just a one-time event. It was something that lasted for six and longer months because it was very complicated. Some of you know, some of you don't know. And what made it complicated was there was three sides to a story. And I was not able to share the details. All I know is that I suddenly found myself in charge of, a, of this building. It was one year old. This fancy building, very fancy. I had no idea what to do. Very intimidated. This building has bells and whistles. It talks to you. It, 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 it be, yeah, it's computer stuff and everything. Very overwhelmed. You have to understand, I was raised in storefronts. My wife was raised in little country churches. You know. We didn't have buttons and stuff. And this thing was, it's a multi-million dollar complex. And I had no idea. And I, had to, I felt the burden of it. And then the burden of the drama, the behind the scenes, uh, 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 people going around having little prayer meetings, uh, which is just a form of two or three agreeing with their own agenda. 
Yeah, that's what this two or three are green to agenda, spiritualize it with Bible verses and call it a prayer meeting, but still, it's still a hidden agenda. And I'm dealing with this thing, and I'm thinking, Lord, I, I, what do I do? Do I say something? Do I confront? Do I slap? That's my, that's my go-to. <laughs> when I'm not in the spirit, I want to slap. <laughs> and God says, no. I was in charge of the facilities, in charge of the finances, and hiring staff. That's a lot of work. Those, those of you who are in business, that's the part of ministry people don't see. And I was struggling not to have fainting spells. They had to wait upon the Lord. Fainting spells. Lord, I spent all week taking the, the, of this drama, and you want me to preach Sunday morning and on Wednesday night and do counseling? Fainting spells. And the Lord brought me back to this verse. They the hope on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount. And for me, that I was thinking like increments. No, you're going to mount like an eagle. You shall run and not be weary. You shall walk and not faint. And I can't tell you, I can't explain to you, but God gave me an anointing during that season, a supernatural anointing. Not because I'm all that, because he's all that. He came in anointing. I said, waiting on him. I said, Lord, I don't want to get hair in fire mode. I said, waiting on him. He gave me that strength, that stamina. I said, I put my hope in him. And I was making decisions left and right. I jugg juggling this, juggling that, having this board meeting. The building, oh, my goodness, this building, crazy stuff happening. Okay, who do I call? What, what do I call? You know, oh, do we still have a warranty? The warranty just expired the week after. This incident happened. Okay, we'll, we'll do what we have to do. Wisdom. I t I'm telling you, it was not from my own neurons. It was the Holy Spirit. And during that time, I spent time in this verse. And God gave me one more verse. I'm going to read it to you. Isaiah 41, the next chapter. Isaiah 41, verse 10. And the Lord said to me, fear not. In other words, faint not. For I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. But then the Lord told me, but for me to uphold you with my right hand, you, can, you need to be standing at my right hand. Your part, Cortez, is to stay close to me. Stay close to my right hand. Wait, wait on me on my right hand. And when you stay close to me, that, that's, your, that, that's the only thing you have to do, baby. Just stay close to me. Wait on me. And I will uphold you with my right hand. When you need to go forward, I'll push you. When you need to stop, I'll stop you. When you, when you need to say something, I'll tap you. And I'll whisper to your ear what you need to say. When, when, you, need, when, you, when you want to slap somebody, I'm going to hold your hand with my right hand. Just stay close to me. In fact, surrender your will to my will. Surrender your will to my will and you'll, you'll be fine. See, so when I hear that phrase, waiting on the Lord, that's what I'm thinking of. Getting close to the Savior. Following his cue, surrendering my attitude, my wish list, what I want to do, my reactionary decisions, and trusting him. There's people here, you're, 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 you're ma trying to manage fainting spells. I'm here to remind you this old verse that I've been preaching it, preaching it again in three months. I don't know. It's, it's up to the Lord. I'm here to remind you. Those that wait in the Lord, those. Are you those? I, I, I choose to be part of that group. Those that wait on the Lord, hope in the Lord. Blessed hope shall renew their strength, renew. They shall mount up with wings, see things from God's perspective. They shall run, exp expedite the time. God will help you during a week what you thought would take you a month. Help you walk and stay steady. 
Not too fast, not too slow. Stay steady. Walking worthy of the things that God has given you. Every head bow, every eye closed. I'm going to pray for some of you. But I'm here today to tell you that if you feel that the Lord, this message was for you, I'm going to invite you to come to the front in a few minutes. Don't worry, the chicken will be available at Luby's. But I don't want to rush the Lord on the Lord's day. What I'm going to do, I'm going to invite you, those of you that you, this message was for you. I'm not going to have you stand in front of me and me touch you. It's between you and the Lord. I'm going to have you come to the front. You can kneel down. You can stand. It takes a few moments and say, Lord, I'm just going to slow down to speed up. I'm going to wait on the Lord. I need to be renewed. If that's you, would you come right now? Hallelujah. I'm gonna, then I'm going to pray over you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can you play? Give me the key for they that wait upon the Lord. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as he goes. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Teach me, Lord, teach me, Lord, to wait. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as he goes. They shall and not be weary. They shall and not faint. Teach me, Lord. Teach me, Lord, to wait. Would you lift up your hands, those of you standing? Oh, God. Lord, thank you again for your word. Thank you for reminding us about the privilege the privilege of waiting on the Lord, the privilege and the opportunity to place our hope on the Lord, not on a deliverance, but on the deliverer, not on being saved, but on the Savior, not on, a, on an event, but on the man, the God-man, Jesus Christ, oh God, oh Lord. Forgive us for taking our eyes away from the Lord. Lord, forgive us for those here that may have put more energy in the work of the Lord rather than the Lord of the work. Forgive us that we've been so busy serving you, we haven't had time to sit at your feet and revel in your presence and be restored and renewed Hallelujah. Oh, God. Lord, I pray for fresh wind right now. Fresh wind. The fresh wind, right? Fresh wind right now. Oh, fresh wind. Everyone here kneeling down, standing, even in their seats, Lord, let them sense the fresh wind of the Holy Spirit as we wait on you, as we learn the joy of slowing down before speeding up. As we experience the peace that passes our understanding. As we refocus our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, the blessed hope. Lord, as we choose to look forward and upward, forward and upward, Lord, we, we don't look for our salvation by looking at Washington, D.C., or Hollywood, or CNN, or Fox News. 
Lord, our salvation comes from the Lord. Lord, we don't get caught up in earthly things. We're called to be salt of the earth and make an impact. But Father, ultimately the goal is for people to make it to heaven. That's the goal. That's why we're here. Lord, this church is not here just to humor people and make them feel comfortable and do cute seminars. Lord, that's not the main purpose. The main purpose is to establish the kingdom of God, advance the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven and to see souls saved and enter the kingdom of God and make it to heaven. That's what we're here for, Lord. So, Lord, thank you. Thank you that you have chosen to use us and love us. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. I pray that we may choose to remain at your righteous right hand, real close to you, real close to you, and let you nudge us and guide us and whisper and tap us in the shoulders and pull our coattail when we need to be pulled and give us a nudge when we need to step forward. Lord, I pray that our lives will be hidden in your life. Thank you for this word this morning. I pray a blessing upon each person here today, every person in the building, every person in Casa de Vida, our Spanish church, every person, every child in children's ministries, Lord, until we come again. I pray that this week, as we, as we celebrate in this country Thanksgiving Day, that we may remember it's not about turkey. It's about giving you thanks and giving you thanks for what you have done and giving you thanks in advance for what you will be doing in our lives. We fail not to give you the glory in Jesus' name. Let's give the Lord a hand. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. God bless you. Love one another. We'll see you Sunday morning. Amen.